Chapter 5. The Power and the Glory Two ancient doxologies from the earliest era of the Church continue in use to this day. These are the Gloria in Excelsis, the Doxologia Major, and the Gloria Patri, the Doxologia Minor. The Gloria in Excelsis, in the English form, declares, quote, Glory be to God on high and on earth, peace, good will towards men. We praise Thee, we bless Thee, we worship Thee, we glorify Thee, we give thanks to Thee for Thy great glory, O Lord God, Heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy on us. For Thou only art holy, Thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. End quote. The Gloria Patri in the Western form declares, quote, Glory be to God the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The glory means the manifestation of the divine nature. In Christian doctrine, in terms of biblical theology, the power and the glory are ascribed only to the triune God. In history, however, men have gained world power or great imperial power, have at the same time claimed the glory for themselves. They have ascribed to themselves divine powers and declared themselves to be the visible manifestation of the divine glory. St. Luke recorded one such incident in Acts 12, 21-23. King Herod claimed, quote, the glory, end quote, for himself and incurred the judgment of God. Where the monarch claims to be the glory of God, it follows, of course, that his realm is therefore the kingdom of God on earth. The Persian Empire clearly declared itself to be this kingdom and its ruler to be the possessor of the divine glory. In the Old Testament, the glory of God means, first, quote, the self-revealed character and being of God, end quote, and second, quote, a physical phenomenon indicative of the divine presence, end quote, the glory of God is also present where God has given power and authority, as unto Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 2.37. St. Paul spoke of woman as, quote, the glory of the man, end quote, that is, quote, the woman making conspicuous the authority of the man, end quote, by her godly obedience. According to Whitman, quote, the, quote, glory of God, end quote, must mean his essential and unchanging Godhead as revealed to man. And the familiar ascription, glory to God, would imply not only a right human praise, but the assigning to God of what he truly is, for nothing higher can be given him. Similarly, the true quote-unquote glory of man or nature must be that ideal condition, that final perfection which exists as a real fact in the divine mind. The glory of God is what he is essentially. The glory of created things is what they are meant by God to be. Though not yet perfectly attained, Hebrews 2.10, Romans 8.18-21, 8, end quote. The word glory also, quote, carries with it ideas of, quote, light, end quote, quote, unquote, splendor and beauty, end quote. In terms of this, it is clear why long hair and a covered head is, quote, unquote, power, 1 Corinthians 11.10, and, quote, glory, end quote, for a woman, 1 Corinthians 11.15 It is the public witness to her acceptance of her ideal and destined rule, and this acceptance and fulfilment of her God-ordained purpose is power and glory for her. This is confirmed by Robert Law, who called attention to the biblical use of glory as meaning the, quote, natural perfection, end quote, of the creature, 1 Peter 1.24, 1 Corinthians 15.40 and 41, 1 Corinthians 11.15 the aspiration of apostate and fallen man has too often been the possession of the divine power and glory in some sense. That this claim was commonplace to pagan civilizations is well known, but 
it was and is common also to cultures claiming to be Christian. The conspicuous example is Byzantium. The imperial court was a religious institution centering on the divine power and glory of the emperor. Everything was done to suggest the glory of God in the person of the emperor. A bronze tree gilded over, whose branches were filled with mechanical gilded birds which uttered cries according to their species, stood before the throne. The throne was surrounded by mechanical lions which roared and beat their tails, and the throne arose toward the ceiling, while the mortals approaching the throne made their three obeisances to the emperor with their faces on the ground. The golden tree was apparently to suggest the tree of life, whose life-giving power the emperor's favour dispensed. In the modern world, the claimants to the power and the glory of God have been less dramatic and more pragmatic and practical. The divinity has been located in the people, in the masses, in democracy, so that, quote, the people, end quote, are in theory the power and the glory. No transcendence is allowed. A total eminence is posited. The divine potency is inherent in the people. Thus, Mao Tse Sung has said of the United States, Hitler, Imperial Russia of the Tsars, Imperial Japan and other past and present powers, that they, quote, are merely paper tigers. The reason is that they are divorced from the people, end quote. The power is in the people. Therefore, quote, the army must become one with the people so that they may see it as their own army. Such an army will be invincible, end quote. But the people cannot be allowed to exercise this power. They are guilty of, quote, ultra-democracy, end quote, end quote. The petty bourgeoisie's individualistic aversion to discipline, end quote, if they think of it. It is actually counter-revolutionary to imagine that the people have the right to exercise their own, quote-unquote, power, and war must be waged against such a belief. Quote, In the sphere of theory, destroy the roots of ultra-democracy. First, it should be pointed out that the danger of ultra-democracy lies in the fact that it damages or even completely wrecks the party organisation and weakens or even completely undermines the party's fighting capacity, rendering the party incapable of fulfilling its writing tasks and thereby causing the defeat of the revolution. Next, it should be pointed out that the source of ultra-democracy consists in the petty bourgeoisie's individualistic aversion to discipline. When this characteristic is brought into the party, it develops into ultra-democratic ideas politically and organisationally. These ideas are utterly incompatible with the fighting tasks of the proletariat. End quote. In the Western countries, these same attempted seizures of the power and the glory, taking various forms, are also present. The concept of, quote, the democratic consensus, end quote, is a common one. The concept of, quote, the democratic consensus, end quote, is a common one. An elite group is the interpreter and possessor of the people's glory in the form of an intellectual tradition. The consensus is not what the people as a majority wish or vote for, but what the elite quote-unquote know they should wish. The consensus is Rousseau's general will, and the elite group is the incarnation of man's power and glory. When Jesus taught that prayer should include the ascription of the power and the glory to God, quote, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Matthew 6.13 he was understanding all of Scripture and all of his ministry. The ascription of the power and the glory to the triune God placed Christianity in conflict with not only the Roman Empire, but every other realm it entered into. The two doxologies were and are expressive of biblical faith. The doxologies joyfully ascribe all the power and the glory to the triune God. They are thus expressive of Christian confidence in the face of a savagely hostile empire. But they are also more. They express an implicit defiance of all counterclaims to the power and the glory. To declare in the face of the world that this sovereignty of God is the timeless reality, quote, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end, amen. 
This was an amazing act. The doxologies thus represented both an amazing confidence and an unbounded faith concerning the certain victory of the triune God over the visible powers of history. They implicitly defy the world in the confidence that the God who makes atonement for men's sins is also their shield and defender, the Lord of time and eternity.' 